Okay, good morning and uh, welcome to the coaches meeting. Um, I am Derek Pagram. I will be your host. Um, you know, when, when we started this podcast a couple weeks ago, um, I, I never, honestly, would never would have dreamt that we would have a guest like the guest that we have today. Um, Division One head coach, University of Idaho, Zach Claus is here to join us today. Zach, um, thank you, number one, for being here. And how you how are you doing this morning? My pleasure. Happy to be with you and doing great this morning. Good man. Um, mo most of the coaches that we that we have on here are high school or maybe local coaches, local college coaches, um, guys that you can't necessarily type into the computer and get their background, right? So when I was doing a little bit of research of you know questions that I want to ask you and stuff like that, you know, I came across you know your playing career, your coaching career. Um, how you started at Creighton and then you went to Nebraska and ended up finishing up at Eastern Washington. Um, so if you could maybe just start out the conversation a little bit by talking about how you got into coaching, number one, was there, you know, like a instrumental person who kind of led you in that direction and then your coaching career, how it got started and how it progressed to now. I've always loved the game played, you know, since I can remember, uh, wore out, basketballs, nets, and backboards at my house uh, growing up and, you know, continued to play, um, you know, a little bit of how I, you know, I ended up, uh, you know, where I did, you know, both playing and coaching was junior year of high school, tore my ACL uh, playing football. And so that took away the rest of my junior year, uh, kind of took a step back. I mean, I would say even before that, I kind of, you know, I knew I wanted to stay in the game moving forward. I don't know that you necessarily know for sure at, you know, 16 years old, what you want to do with the rest of your life. But, yeah. uh, but it was something that I, you know, I've always been involved with the game. Love it. Um, you know, I tell our players to this day, I mean, I, I love what I do. I mean, you know, there's a whole lot of days where I get to come to work. I put on a pair of shorts and I get to go to practice. So yeah. that to me is, is awesome. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've been very fortunate from the game. Uh, you know, three of the most important people in my life I met because of basketball. And like you said, I, I, I grew up in Lincoln, Nebraska. I went to Creighton. My, my uncle actually played there, uh, years ago before I did had a wonderful experience, um, and met my best buddy in the world and still is to this day. And he happened to be a senior, uh, my freshman year and I was a magnet for Denny Halligan. I mean, I hung out with him nonstop and, uh, you know, best man in my wedding and, uh, you know, continue, you know, to stay attached to him. Learn quickly that, uh, a Jesuit education was going to cost me dearly. And I knew, you know, I figured out quickly, I was like, I don't know if I can go into this much debt. Um, and then had the opportunity to go to Nebraska, as you mentioned, and met my mentor. Uh, you know, I'd met him before. Jeff Smith was an assistant coach at the University of Nebraska at that time. He actually went to the same high school that I did growing up. Okay. And so made a connection with him, had an awesome year uh, with, with those guys, we played for Coach Nee. Uh, Gary Bargan was an assistant at that time and, and you know, kind of helped uh, run the scout team, uh, which – it was myself and in, we had three incoming freshmen that year. And it was so Chad Ideas, Andy Markowski and Leif Nelson. And our job for every, you know, for every preparation was to be the other team. And, you know, I, growing up back there, I was a Nebraska football fan and a Kansas basketball fan. Okay. And so I'll never forget, you know, that's when KU, I mean, they always are, but they were rolling. And for three, four days, I was Jacques Vaughn, who was a favorite of mine. I'll never forget going through the handshake line after the game, pulling him aside and saying, hey, it was awesome being you for the past three, four days because they played fast. Yeah. And it was awesome. Um, and then at that time, the NCAA had what was called a restricted earnings coach. And that's what Jeff's role was at Nebraska. And he actually that spring took a job at Eastern Washington working for Steve Baggers. And he came to me and said, you want to take a chance? And I thought so highly of him and I'm dating myself. I still think I'm pretty young, but you talk about no internet, no nothing. And I had no idea where Cheney Washington was. And uh, with all that said, he said, why don't you take a chance and let's go. And I packed up a car and headed west. 
and uh, it, it worked out terrific. I learned so much from playing for Coach Aggers. I uh, continue to stay in touch with him to this day. And something that, uh, you know, we joke about still to this day, uh, you know, Jeff's comment was, you know, we're going to have a whole lot of fun and maybe you'll meet your future bride out here. And I actually did. Uh, met my wife, Tony, who actually was from Washington, played volleyball at Eastern Washington. Okay. And so – I tell our guys all the time, you just never know the relationships, the opportunities and, you know, what's going to open up because of this wonderful game that we all love. And like I said, three of absolutely the most important people in my life are a direct correlation to the game of basketball and where it's taken me. Yeah, that's and that's special, right? That's I mean, that's what makes basketball more than just the game um, that everybody sees it as. It, it goes deeper. And when you make the when you make the stops that you made and you, you just pick up different things as you go. And like you said, you meet um, people that'll be in your life forever. And it's, yeah. it's just amazing what it can bring you. Um, so the, the coach that you followed to Eastern Washington, was he instrumental in getting you into the coaching aspect of things after you're done playing? He was just because, you know, I looked up to him number one and then number two, you know, he, he'd bring me in. We'd talk about it. And I mean, it was something that, you know, when I first met him, I was still in high school and it was, you know, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with school, knowing that I had a passion for the game and knowing that that's what I wanted to do ultimately. So being around him, I mean, I've, you know, while I was playing, there were a number of, you know, times where, I was either in his office, I was at his house, hanging out with him and his wife, Robin. Uh, and, you know, just my relationship with him is still off the charts special to this day. Uh, you know, having the chance to be in the position I am now. I mean, one of the first things I, I got on the phone with him to share the news, number one. But then during the year, we actually got him on a plane, flew him out here, and he spent a few days with our program. And he was he was in every staff meeting. He stayed at my house so that we could, you know, spend that much more time together talking about it. And he was, if we had a team meeting, if we met in the locker room, he was there, he was at practice, he was at a, one of our games. And it was, uh, it was great to get his insight. And then selfishly, it was unbelievably special to have him here and share in it because he's helped get me here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when, when it comes to, you know, you were just talking about um, bringing him in this last year. You just finished your first year as head coach. Um, you got brung, you got brought in not in the best circumstances, I would probably say, in terms of the program. Um, but if you if you could talk about maybe that first year, some of the experiences that you went through, um, some of the things that you learned. You're right in terms of two things. You dream about getting this opportunity and not in a million years would you want it to happen under the circumstances that it did and you know still have you know a whole lot of frustration uh and just you feel bad about the guys that you're here with that you're working alongside and because it impacts not only fellow coaches but it impacts families and you just hate to see that um with that said, it was, you know, an opportunity. Uh, Pete Isaacson, who was our athletic director at the time, afforded me the opportunity to lead the program, will forever be indebted to him. And, uh, you know, looked at it from the vantage point. At the time when everything went down, we had one senior on our roster, and that was Trayvon Allen, who had been a three-year uh, player here at Idaho, grew up shoot in Lapway, which is 45 minutes away from our campus. Yeah. Both of his parents went to school here. His dad played football here. I mean, he had just an unbelievable connection to the university, the athletic department. And one of my very first thoughts was this poor kid, this is not what he signed up for. You know, he, and I, I say that about him, but obviously the entire roster that they, this isn't what they signed up for. I'm not the guy they signed up to play for in terms of just in terms of a head coach. Yeah. And I just I took on the responsibility of we've got to make this as special of a year for not only him, but the whole roster uh, as we possibly could, because when everything happened, nothing was promised. I knew that we were, you know, the coaches and I, we were going to have the opportunity to coach the team for, you know, this season, you know, in terms of the 1920 year. And then we see what happens. And, you know, it started with like I said, it started with Pete. 
And then with our new uh, leadership on campus, with President Scott Green, who's been amazing since his start last July, to then Terry Golick when she took over in September of last year, those two individuals could not have been more supportive of our staff, our team, and have been, you know, instrumental in what we've been able to do, you know, since taking over last summer. And, you know, can't be more thankful to both of them for allowing us to keep moving forward because we couldn't be more excited about helping lead this program to greater days moving forward. Yeah. And, you know, Trayvon, I, I was he, he went to Clarkson High School um, and I was coaching at Lewiston High School as an yeah. assistant when he was there. So I, I got okay. to see up front how talented that kid was at a really early age. Um, but, yeah, like you were just talking about the character of that kid. Right. His character to take on, you know, a new coach. And it might not have been ideal situation, but he took it on and he, and he did pretty well last year. I believe he's now playing overseas. Right. Playing in Poland. He is. And, yeah. you know, to, to your point, uh, with the with the career that he had had thus far, playing three great years, being a, a, a part of really successful seasons, both his freshman and sophomore year. And in today's climate, in terms of players moving around so much, it would have been really easy for Trayvon to, uh, you know, jump ship and gone somewhere else to play. And, you know, I know that in talking to him in hindsight, him talking with his family, you know, they, they made the decision that this is where they wanted to be. And he wanted to finish here and he wanted to, you know, leave his mark and, and do what he could for this program. And, you know, we certainly appreciated you know, that mindset from him and his folks, uh, you know, he went on to have an unbelievable senior year in terms of, you know, obviously his scoring to be 15th in the nation to, yeah. to in scoring. Uh, I'm really happy for him in terms of, I mean, he literally just jumped on a plane days ago to head over to Poland to play professionally, which, you know, was his dream to do. And I, and I, you know, selfishly for me, and I know uh, his mom and dad, I'm, I know are smiling too. I was just, as proud of him as anything he's accomplished in his whole time here when he finally finished up his last classes and earned his degree in May. And I would be, uh, I'd be crazy not to bring up, we've got the best academic support system here. And in, in terms of our director, Krista Gray, who has been amazing for our program since she's been here for the last two years. And I know she shares a terrific relationship with Trayvon. And again, our, uh, our whole staff, our program is thrilled that uh, he walked away from here with a degree from Idaho. Yeah, he was he was a he was a special player for sure. Um, when when a senior like that um, graduates, moves on, what's what's the transition uh, that your program takes into looking at the new guys you have coming in, looking at your returning players? What what are you guys doing this summer? maybe that is trying to formulate what next year is going to look like on the court a little bit. Luckily for us, we really like our returning nucleus of guys that are coming back and, you know, they will have a year having played for our staff and understanding, you know, what the level of expectation is and that's both on and off the floor. And so we're very excited about them. Uh, and then we were able to add five incoming guys and, it was uh, to say it was unique in terms of recruiting would be putting it mildly. Uh, you know, we're excited. We have Tanner Christensen coming in who, who played uh, at University High School up in Spokane. He actually signed with us two years ago and went on a mission. And all of this happened. All of the all the change within our program happened while he was not only not around, but he was out of the country. Yeah. And so we're really grateful to him and his family for continuing to honor his commitment. He's excited. He's already taken summer classes and, and excelling in those, and we can't wait to get him down. Yeah. Uh, we added Ethan Kilgore in the fall of last year, which under the circumstances, I still honestly am not quite sure how we did that. Uh, Ethan came out here with his parents from just outside of Kansas City, and he was somebody that we identified last summer. Um, he ended up being the all-time leading scorer from his high school. He brings a college body already to the mix. And at that time, we, our staff, we were still in an interim mode. Yeah. And so we were able to convince him, uh, you know, that this was the place to be. And 
Obviously, we wanted to be here with him. We wanted to be the ones coaching him moving forward. But it was trying to tell him, hey, you're going to have terrific teammates no matter what. They're already in place. Trust the leadership. And I mentioned President Green and Miss Golick, you know, that they're going to make the right decision. Now, again, you know, selfishly, we hoped it would be us, uh, but we knew moving forward. And I tell you what, it's a, it's a shot in the arm when a high school senior believes in you enough to say, coach, this is where I want to go. And, you know, you're going to make this happen. Yeah. And so I'm thrilled for him. Uh, and then, I mean, you ask about the guys uh, moving forward. I haven't been, and, you know, we talked about this as a staff, we haven't been with our whole team in, in the same room since mid-March when we left a hotel lobby in Boise after the conference tournament. Wow. So the guys have been ho- – almost everybody's still at home. Um, and then moving forward, you know, we added three members to our program this spring without ever going out to see them in person. And these guys have still yet to ever come to Moscow. So Kendall McHugh, who had a terrific freshman year at College of Southern Idaho, where he plays for Coach Jeff Reinert, yeah. uh, he signed with us in the spring. We think he's going to bring an unbelievable toughness and uh, ability to handle the ball and make plays. So we were able to add him. He's currently still at home in Virginia. Uh, Hunter Madden is a high school point guard that's actually from Australia of all places. So not only uh, (laughs) it's one thing to try to convince kids from the States to come uh, out here without ever coming to Moscow, but we've we've convinced him from a world away. And then DeAndre DeAndre, uh, Robinson is uh, a very talented scoring forward that originally is from Alabama, played last year at at one of the highest level junior colleges down in uh, Tallahassee. And just really excited about those three guys that we were able to add this spring and, and confident about moving forward with, you know, the whole roster that we have now. Yeah. And, you know, I, St. Mary's has done all right recruiting some of those Australian guys. So they you certainly know, have. you're right. We'll come up to you guys as well. Um, you you kind of just touched on it uh, about and I and, you know, I asked uh, Colby Blaine, the head coach of College of Idaho, this question last week. Um, about when they found out that the season was going to be shut down, that, you know, no more games were going to go on. Um, And, you know, their story is pretty interesting because they were at the national tournament. You know, they were getting ready to, you know, play a game. Um, So I was just kind of wondering, you know, when was the moment you found out and how did you kind of let everyone on your staff, every one of the players, how did you let them know the best that you could in that situation, right? Yeah, it was a tough it was a tough situation. And we were obviously a little bit different uh, than what Colby was going through. I mean, he was pushing forward, trying to play for a national title and they've got an amazing program down there and they are fun to keep tabs on and and follow. I've got a lot of respect for their program down there. For us, it was different. Uh, Everything was starting to hit. uh, Especially about the day before our conference tournament game day of, is when it really started to come to a head because we actually played our first round game, played a tough battle back and forth with Southern Utah and unfortunately lost that game. Well, then it was that night that it hit about Rudy Gobert testing positive. And so that's when really things started to change. And it was, you know, watching it from, from our hotel room, seeing the how it impacted different tournaments. Um, but honestly, where it really hit us and was a difficult thing to be a part of was we were actually in the lobby of the hotel in Boise. Our women's team had already won two games. And so they were prepping for the conference title game with a yeah. shot to go to the NCAA tournament. Yeah. And we had it relayed to us that everything was getting shut down. And so we just we happened to be wrong place at the wrong time watching our women's team be called to a team meeting to have it relayed to them that we're done. It's over. And so uh, that was painful to watch because we're so close with coach Newley and his staff who are awesome to be partners with and work with. And we get to know those kids. I mean, you know, we get to know those young women that are on that team and they were 40 minutes away from, you know, realizing their dream of playing, you know, in the, in the NCAA tournament. And so, our hearts went out to them. I mean, it was tough to be a part of. And uh, 
you know, so we, we tried to, you know, you know, console them as best we could, you know, be supportive of them. And then before we knew it, shoot, we were on a bus headed back here, um, you know, telling all of our guys, you know, to be careful. Uh, I, I've joked with other folks that it's the first time I've ever stood before a team and said, don't go to class tomorrow. <laughs> and, you know, then it was get on the phone, talk to your moms, talk to your dads, figure out what, you know, and it was so new at that time. Yeah. And it was, you know, talk to your families, figure out how, what they want you to do in terms of travel, in terms of how they want you to get home. And the world's been a different place ever since that day. Yeah. yeah. How, tough, how tough of a situation is that, you know, when, like you said, they're playing for the championship game to go to the NCAA tournament, things that you dream of, especially, right. you know, as a, as a coach, you work your whole career to get to that spot. And then that happens. That's just, oh man, that's, that's heartbreaking. Um, when you, when you took over the program at Idaho, you, you spent some time um, being an assistant coach at the university of Nevada. And then you come up to Idaho and you were assistant for a few years as well. Right. Yeah, I was. Um, and then you get tagged as the interim coach. Now you had been part of the program. So you knew the recruiting and you knew the style that they were playing offense, defense. You had a big part of it, obviously, but, um, being the head coach, how is your philosophy with the kids that you have when you walk into a program? How does that change or how do you have to equip your philosophy to kind of fit the players that are already there? Maybe kids that you wouldn't necessarily have got if you were the head coach, right? Um, so how do you take over a program, take the kids that you have and kind of formulate with the philosophy that you have? Sure. You know, you you pick up things over your coaching career, I've been very lucky. And I worked on a really good staff here at Idaho. And, you know, we had had success. And so it wasn't a matter of by any means of trying to blow things up and start from scratch. Uh, you know, there were a lot of good things in place. And so it's picking and choosing a little bit, especially, especially under the circumstances we were last summer, last fall, moving forward. Um, you know, again, I get back to, you know, the players in the program, you know, this isn't what they had signed up for. And, you know, so much of why a young man makes a decision about where they're going to go play is for, you know, who they're going to play for and specifically the head coach. And so I was very aware of that and wanted to be fair to those guys and try to do, you know, do right by them. And it's, it's a difficult challenge, but it was one that, you know, we, we knew going in. Um, but like you said, you, you pull from, you know, and again, I take from what I learned here. I was very fortunate in my time at Nevada. I worked for two terrific head coaches and Mark Fox, who's now at, at Cal and David Carter, who shoot, I've known since I was a player at Eastern Washington. He was an assistant there when I first arrived. And, you know, I still lean on both of those guys. Uh, and, and, you know, keep that open communication because until you're in the position, uh, you know, you, you, you know, you're offering suggestions. You think you understand everything that goes into the day to day. Yeah. And now you just have, just because you're actually doing it and you have a new perspective. And so I now have newfound questions that I lean on those guys for, and Hey, you know, I'm dealing with this set of circumstances, your thoughts. And, Something that, you know, stood out with both Coach Fox and I know Coach Newley, our women's coach here. And when everything first happened, you know, you reach out to a few people that you really trust and get their input. And both of them had, you know, only a few, you know, specific things, but I'll never forget both of them. The last thing they said was trust your gut. And you have to be you. I, you know, I can't try to emulate other, even though I've been around great coaches in my past, I still have to be, at, you know, I have to be me and I have to, you know, bring my demeanor to the practice floor. I still have to bring my attitude to, you know, how we do things. And yeah. that's, that was, that was some great advice from both of those guys. And, you know, something else is just as you have, you know, the bigger decisions that you have, you have bigger thoughts to address, you know, I've joked, uh, there's been very few times over the course of this past calendar year where I've hurried up and made a quick decision. It's something more times than not, I will sleep on it and I'll just have a much more clearer view about whatever I'm dealing with 
that next day and I'll feel even better about what we've decided as a staff moving forward. Yeah, I agreed. And I think, I think a lot of times too, um, people react too quickly, especially now when, I mean, you probably have this happen to you all the time. You're walking off the court after a game and there's a, you know, there's a microphone right in your face and you have to respond to tough questions right on the spot without thinking of them, planning them. Like that's, that's gotta be difficult. So I mean, kudos to you for being able to do that in the, in the fashion that you do, Coach. Yeah. Um, now, what what is the – your and the University of Idaho right now, what is your guys' offensive philosophy? What is your defensive philosophy? What, what are you guys running and stuff right now? Well, in terms of, you know, moving forward offensively, it's still something that, uh, you know, I joke with our players. I joke with recruits all the time. My favorite player of all time is Steve Nash. And I love the ability to get out, go in transition. Uh, and if we can play effective that way, yeah. but I will also tell guys right away that if we're not defending, if we're not getting stops and if we're not taking care of the ball, then I'll be, you know, I'll be the guy putting up the stop sign and saying, Hey, you know, we've got to play a different way. Yeah. And so moving forward, I hope that it'll be a little bit different in terms of what we did a year ago. We simply didn't feel like what we had on our roster, you know, just in terms of overall what we had, we just, we couldn't just go out and think we were going to outscore teams by playing in the eighties just wasn't in our makeup. We yeah. felt like we really had to hang our hat defensively. And so moving forward, we hope to play at a little bit quicker tempo in that regard. We hope to play with a little bit more freedom in terms of our guys' ability to play in space, uh, be able to play off the dribble, to be unselfish, to take advantage of the three-point shot, which is such a, a big part of our game right now. Yeah. So that's you know the mindset moving forward offensively. Defensively, uh, I am a – you know. I, I talk nonstop to our guys in terms of having a want to, to guard. And so, you know, we're predominantly going to play, you know, hang our hat on our man defense in terms of, you know, sitting down, being able to get stops and, you know, first and foremost, as much as I like to get out and go in transition, I hate to give up transition baskets. Yeah. So, you know, First and foremost, it is getting our tails back in transition and, and forcing your opponent to have to score against you in the half court. Uh, you know, I talk all the time. I am not a home run hitting defensive minded guy. I want, you know, I want you to have a mindset that, you know, these guys have to score against us five on five. You sit down and you have a mindset. I'm keeping the ball in front of me. I'm keeping the ball out of the paint. I'm, you know, I, if I'm a big guy, I'm keeping the ball off this, you know, my, my, my opponent's sweet spot and just trying to contest as many shots as possible. It's something that, you know, offensively we believe in charting what's a good shot and what's a bad shot. And that sometimes is tough to hear, you know, for guys that we're recruiting that they were the best player on their team. They yeah. were the leading scorer on their team. Yeah. And now they're a part of a bigger place, a bigger program where they're not the best player. They're yeah. not, you know, them shooting 33% from three isn't a good thing. And, you know, we talk to them about, you've got to put in the time, you, you know, and, you know, we keep stressing to our guys, you know, via Zoom calls right now, via text, via phone calls, hey, you, we need you getting in the gym. We need you getting your workouts in yeah. to improve so that when the season comes, you know, and you want to shoot, you know, you've earned that right to, you know, to knock down shots. And then, you know, conversely, you know, that's what we keep tabs on off or, uh, offensively. Then defensively, it's how many shots are we contesting and not contesting? And to me, that is enormous because the numbers speak for themselves. Uh, you know, it's something that we consistently talk about at halftime of games is, hey, guys, here's what they're shooting on contested shots which is typically, you know, 20% or lower yeah. and on contested shots, you know, layups, transition, open jumpers. This is why they're winning or this is why they're still, you know, right there with us. And yeah. so those are the things we kind of hang our hats on both offensively and defensively and we'll continue to do so. Okay. Um, when you are, when you are out on the recruiting trail, when you're looking at kids, how, how much are you trying to find the kid um, that relates to what you guys do in comparison to finding 
maybe just the best kid. I know, you know, at the at the high school level, it's it's different because we get who who we get, right? Whatever kids go to that school, we can't necessarily have a philosophy and just stick with it. Like I can't I can't say I'm gonna run the Kansas three around two motion every single year. Cause right. what if I don't have bigs one year, right? So but it's different with college because you get to recruit your kids that you want to come play for you. So how much do you stick with that philosophy on your recruiting and how much do you kind of go maybe off trail a little bit to try and just find maybe that that's a really good basketball player. He might not fit our philosophy to a T, but man, yeah. we want that kid. Well, you go into it, you know, with the mindset of, you know, simply finding talented, you know, basketball players. And, yeah. you know, when we get on the phone with a recruit, it's you know, I'm calling you because you stood out, whether it be in person, on film, uh, word of mouth. Uh, you know, we've we've come to identify that you've got a great skill set in terms of, you know, the game of basketball. Yeah. For us, it's getting to know the young man, talking to him, talking to everybody around him. Uh, you know, we are we are, you know, probably slower moving in terms of offering scholarships to guys because we want to make sure that they're the right fit for us in yeah. terms of them as a person. Uh, we want to talk to mom, dad, and it's not just myself or and or one assistant coach. Typically, with our recruits that we keep moving forward with every last one of our coaches on staff have had multiple conversations with them. So that, you know, when they come to campus, this isn't you're meeting one of our assistant coaches for the first time. Yeah, we want you know, we want that overall relationship in terms of on the floor. You know, from a stylistic standpoint, we want guys that are skilled, can shoot it um, just because that is such a necessary skill. I mean, you know, the, the object of the game is to outscore your opponent. And yeah. you know, we want guys that can knock it down. Uh, at the, you know, within that same sentence, we want guys that are smart and, you know, we want guys that can think the game that are cerebral about it, that can pick up a scouting report that can, Hey, we're going to make this adjustment to this play in this game. And we're going to be able to do it on the fly. Uh, you know, do they, do you have the ability to do that? And we're going to learn that by talking to, you know, their high school coach, their, you know, their, their AAU coach, their junior college coach. Uh, you know, we're also going to reach out to, you know, coaches that played against them you know what was this kid like to play against yeah, yeah. Um, and then last but not least we want guys that are tough and you know we want guys that will step in there and take a charge we want guys that are willing to give up their body to set a great screen we want guys that it is a natural instinct because it is not for every kid that when they see a ball loose on the floor they dive on it yeah it's, just, it, it's not a an every every player thing and so those are the three things that we're looking for, uh, you know, and then we want a guy that's going to be a great teammate. We're paying attention on film. We're paying attention in person. How are you when you're taken out of the game? Yeah. Are you reacting? Are you up cheering for your teammates when they score? When your coach is frustrated with you because you took a bad shot or, you know, you, you committed a, a, you know, a bad foul, what's your body language like? Are you, are you walking by without, you know, talking to any of the coaches as you come out? Are you sitting right by the coaches? Are you staying engaged? Are you cheering for your teammates? How are you? You know, we're watching all those little things because they speak volumes. Yeah. And, you know, that's man. I wish Pitt's kids could pick up on that a little bit more. Um, you know, I tell my JV kids that I tell my freshman kids that like if you come out of the game and you have bad body language or you, you know, you're not listening to your coach, you're not looking at him in the eye. Like, what do you think I'm thinking? I'm the head coach. You know, how does that look for me? I just I wish they would pick up on that a little bit more, you know, um, well, it's something that we stress here. And, uh, you know, it's something that I, I stole a long time ago and held on to. And we don't have many things, uh, you know, displayed in our locker room. But one of them is body language screams. It never whispers. And we are constantly talking to our guys in terms of on the floor, at practice, during a game, on the bench, in our team meetings. I said, you guys are talking to me without saying a word. You know, there's guys that, will, you know, sometimes will be slumped down in a chair. Yeah. I will stop and say, sit up. I said, you're doing the same thing, you know, right here. I'm, you know, in a, in a classroom. So what are you, what are you, what are you communicating to a professor? If you're, if you decide to sit in the back of the class instead of sitting up front, like we ask you to do yeah. that, you, you know, take your hat off. Don't have your ear, your, your headphones on, sit up, give them your eyes, be attentive. 
Yeah. And so I, I, we are a big one on that. Body language screams. It never whispers. I'm taking that. Okay. I'm going to take I, it. I stole it from somebody else. So you hey, that's coping, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, when you guys, when you are talking to a recruit, how much, how much are you guys right now talking about um, the new arena that's being built right now on campus? Cause I saw a video last night, you know, of what it's projected to look like. And that thing, that's pretty sweet. So how much are you using that as kind of like a recruiting tool? We absolutely do. And with good reason, it is a beautiful structure already. And it's still a year away from being done. Yeah. I had the good fortune of going out there and actually got to put a hard hat on last week and walk around and, you know, meet with a couple of the, the guys that are hands on and, you know, out there every single day and they're making progress uh, even in spite of everything going on in our country right now those folks have been hard at work on a daily basis and there's part of the crew that they're out there six days a week and we couldn't be more appreciative of their efforts their time uh, it's going to be fantastic and to answer your question we are absolutely bringing it up to recruits it's something that uh, you know with some of our recruits that we've we've visited with in terms of them and their families via zoom it's something that we've highlighted with them and i do it with complete conviction now because it's a reality yeah. uh, you know i had a hard time initially because this is something that you know far before my time ever coming to idaho it's been something that's been talked about, dreamt about, planned for, you know, that what was going to happen here. And, you know, and it obviously takes a great deal of money, uh, you know, foresight to move forward on a project like this. And I was always very hesitant to ever bring it up with a recruit until it was really going to happen, until the money was raised, until, you know, a shovel was put into the ground that, you know, this is happening. And now, you know, now we're talking to young men and their families where shoot every game that they're going to play their whole career here at Idaho is going to be played in that building. Yeah. And so it's going to be an amazing place. Uh, it's going to be so much fun to work in that environment. Uh, and, you know, you get back to what we were originally talking about to be a basketball coach is a dream come true. And, yeah. you know, that this is what I get to do for a living is, is off the charts. And to work in that building will be incredible. And so I know that Coach Newley and his staff uh, feel the exact same way. And and we're, we're really looking forward to that opportunity. Yeah. You're a lucky man, Coach, to get the hard hat and go and check it out before anybody else. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, I, I have a couple game day questions for you. When it comes to your assistant coaches, how much are you, what are you taking on on the game days and what are your assistant coaches doing? I lean on them a great deal. I'm very, very lucky. Uh, you know, the, the, the first phone call that I made in terms of, you know, basketball, when everything happened was I reached out to Doug Nofsek, who uh, is our associate head coach. Yeah. And I had the good fortune of working alongside him for nine years when we were at Nevada together. And he was here this past year. And I joke that the conversation wasn't, will you come out to Idaho? It was, I need you. You're coming. Let's start working on how quickly you can come. Yeah. Uh, he's terrific. And I lean on him, not just on game days. I lean on him every day. Uh, you know, most days we put together a practice plan as a staff. You know, I, I uh, put it together and then I throw it on his desk and make him second guess me, you know, What's what's out of order? What you know, what needs a little bit more time? What would you throw out? Am I missing anything? Yeah. Um, and then Kenny Tripp, who's also an assistant coach for us, first met him as a bright eyed 17 year old, uh, you know, wanted to be a manager for our program at Nevada. And, you know, now he's an assistant coach for us. Uh, he brings the most energetic, positive attitude of anybody I'm around. And our guys gravitate to him. Uh, he's a natural in his role here. And then we just hired uh, a few weeks ago, we hired Benny Seltzer, who beyond fortunate to be able to add somebody with his experience, his credentials, uh, you know, for a guy that has coached and recruited at Washington State at Oklahoma, at Marquette, at Indiana, for crying out loud, for, to add somebody of his stature to our staff. 
I've surrounded myself with three amazing coaches. And in terms of game day, you know, our assistants split up in terms of scouting report responsibility. So they've they've devoured a whole lot of, of tape. And it's not just, you know, Derek, I give you, you know, a specific team to watch. Yeah, you're breaking it down and you know them as good as anybody, but, you know, we're collectively watching it, talking, you know, brainstorming, throwing ideas off of one another. How do we want to defend this? What plays do we think are going to work? Personnel wise, you know, one or two of our guys who may have played Thursday night because of matchups may not have the same role come Saturday night. Yeah. And, you know, that's a hard one for our guys to understand because it's just yeah. like, well, I played well on Thursday night. You know, how does it not make sense? And that's what, you know, we take a great deal into. So, you know, working on the scouting report, you know, most most games will have a shoot around. And, uh, you know, prior to where we bring the guys in, get some shots up, uh, you know, review a little bit, both ourselves offensively, defensively, go over a few things as far as what our opponent's going to do. And again, I lean on those guys. But at the same time, you know, game day, uh, you know, we've done a great deal of our preparation, you know, the days before. I want those guys as fresh as possible, uh, you know, so I don't need them here in the office first thing in the morning. Uh, you know, I want them to relax, you know, you know, you know, have a free mind going into, you know, the game, especially if it's a night game playing at seven o'clock. Yeah. Uh, at the same time, you know, I'm a big one on, I want all of our coaches, I want you to go get a workout in, you know, get your own sweat in, you know, get something, you know, get your mind off things, clear your head a little bit and, you know, feel good yourself as well. Yeah. And then come game time, uh, you know, we work hand in hand, you know, getting the guys loose before the game, talking again prior to the game, you know, any second, you know, second things we need, you know, to second guess ourselves about, you know, what do we want to do? Do we still like these matchups? Do we want to switch up our defenses at all? You know, stuff like that. And then during the game, you know, it's being, you know, those guys are terrific in terms of bouncing ideas off of one another. Uh, and then, you know, Doug is typically, you know, a voice when the action is going on that I hear him just so it's not congested. And, you know, you have too many voices to concentrate uh, to make decisions. Yeah. You know, we're constantly talking during full timeouts as far as, you know, throwing ideas off of one another. You do the same thing half time wise. Yeah. Uh, and then after the game, you know, I'll be the first to say, you know, uh, you know, if, if things went well, you know, what could we still have done better? And at the same time, if the game didn't go our way. I'm the first one leaning on those guys saying, OK, what did I do wrong? You know, who could I have played more minutes here? What could we have run that may have been more effective? And I, you know, I ask those guys to be critical of what I'm doing yeah. so that hopefully moving forward to the next game, the next week, you know, and moving forward for this upcoming season, we can be even better. Yeah. I, yeah. Programs. If you have good assistant coaches, you're going to have a good program. You know, that's that's kind of what I've found out along my way as well, because, um, you you know, if you coach long enough, you're going to be into situations where assistant coaches are great or assistant coaches are not as, you know, involved with maybe how they should be. You know, and that, you know, that's the high school game, probably a little bit more than the college game. Um, but when you when you think about your your college assistant coach and the journey that they have to take to make it to, you know, to a division one school, the process they have to go through maybe all the moves that they have to make. Um, and I know, you know, looking at your background as well, you made a couple moves and, you know, you have a family. And so what, what is that? How is that being at one spot, moving to the next, taking your family with you, re-enrolling your kids into a different school? Um, it's got to be hard, but, you know, then you get to your final, you know, to your spot. And then it's, you know, I would imagine it's all worth it. It is. And I am uh, because, like you said, because having gone through it, having a family of our own, we have three beautiful girls. And, you know, for us, we were very fortunate. We lived in, in Nevada for 10 years, which is a, in college basketball yeah. world. It's a long time. And that was a tough thing to experience because we had so much fun uh, being a part of the Nevada program. But at the same time, where all my kids grew up. I mean, that's still to this day where they consider home yeah. and they had, they have, uh, you know, lifelong friendships because of that. And I'm so grateful that because of technology for them compared to when I grew up, I mean, 
we can FaceTime their friends. You know, yeah. we can easily still communicate where it just just wasn't as easy for us growing up. Yeah. Um, so that's been great. Uh, you know, in terms of then moving them to Moscow, we've found ourselves in a absolutely wonderful place. Uh, you know, our kids have had an incredible school experience. And I know that, you know, going back to last spring where there was a lot of uncertainty in terms of what was going to happen there. I, I had no idea that, you know, something positive was going to happen. Yeah. And it was one thing to, you know, to feel that selfishly as a coach and okay, what does this mean for my career? But the first thing I did was I hopped in the car. I drove to see Tony, my wife, and visited with her. Hey, here's what's going on. And then I literally got back in the car and I drove to see my two oldest. And just because I didn't want them hearing it from anybody else, yeah. just because, again, you know, the social media of things, I didn't want a friend in class saying, hey, what, what just happened at your dad's work? Uh, I wanted them hearing it from me. And so was able to connect with them that way. And then, you know, our oldest, uh, Peyton is, a, you know, she just finished her senior year of high school. And again, you don't think about it when you're just talking college basketball, but don't get me wrong. She was as excited as anybody for me to have the opportunity to be a head coach. But in turn, I was even more excited for her to be able to stay at the same school for her senior year. Yeah. And that meant, you know, that was as big as anything. And, you know, for the not, you know, for somebody not involved in college basketball, I'm sure some, you know, you don't even think about that aspect of it. But for those of us in it, you know, and I always think about it when, you know, when when there's a when there's a change of a staff, my first thought is always the families of the assistant coaches because yeah. you know their world has just been flipped upside down. There's so much uncertainty, and you always feel for those folks uh, to go through it. But. Again, we've been very fortunate in the people we've been surrounded by, both you know, in terms of coaching staff, community, the schools that we've been a part of. So for my kids, uh, you know, to live in Sparks, Nevada, and now in Moscow has been terrific. Yeah, um, and you you mentioned your daughter Peyton. She's going to play college basketball, right? She's going to NIC. Well, she is a volleyball player. She played well, she played basketball in high school. Uh, okay. I loved watching her play, but. Uh, I married a volleyball player. All three of my daughters uh, have taken up the sport, and uh, yeah, I'm 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 thrilled for her. She this is what she wanted to do. She wanted to keep playing. Uh, Kelsey Stanley up at North Idaho has been terrific to Peyton in, in her recruitment of her, and I was uh, I was ecstatic that uh, you know she had the opportunity to keep playing and selfishly to do it uh, only a, you know a short drive uh, to get up there and go watch her play is going to be awesome. Yeah, for sure. Um, Coach, I got a couple more questions for you and then I'll, you know, I'll let you go. Um, advice for high school coaches. You know, I, I, you get lots of players every year. You go through a ton of players in your career and some come in more prepared than others. Um, what, what advice would you give to a high school coach? Uh, not only on, you know, maybe how to run your program, things you could possibly look at here or there, um, but also how if you get the opportunity to coach kids who are able to go play at that next level, how to prepare them the best um, to come into a Division One setting, not only as a basketball player, but as a student? Well, to the high school coaches, I would say embrace the opportunity you have to make an impact. Yeah. You know, we, we run across it on a daily basis with our recruitment when we talk to kids and we ask them, you know, what's it like, you know, or what coach has stood out to you? And it's overwhelmingly their high school coach, yeah. just the impact they've had on them. You know, this, my coach pushes me, you know, my coach encourages me. My coach will open up the gym when I want to go shoot. Uh, you know, you guys have an amazing impact on young people and just don't take it for granted. And, you know, from your best guy, to that 12, 13, those guys on the JV team, the guys, you know, in your, in your freshman team, keep, ha you know, keep touching them, keep talking to them, yeah. uh, you know, know that, know that your voice, know that, you know, don't, don't take for granted that you're the head coach. You know, when you, when those kids go home, Hey mom, Hey dad, the head varsity coach said this to me today. 
Yeah. It's going to stand out. It's going to have, you know, that M, it's going to help push them. And you may think of it as just a small, minute, hey, I, you know, in your head, you're thinking, shoot, I just talked to that kid for two minutes. Yeah. To yeah. him, it was the best part of his day. Yeah. And you just know, you never know what's going to trigger it because you're in a wonderful leadership position and you have to take full advantage of it. So that's, you know, that's what I would say. And, and, you know, from our standpoint, from our chair, you know, we appreciate everything you guys do because, you know, that's the basis of, you know, their skill set, their fundamentals. And, you know, in terms of pushing your best guys, coach them hard, you know, push them, uh, you know, don't, don't change your program's level of expectation for that young man, you know, hold them to the highest rung because if your JV kids, see you pointing out a mistake in film on, on the practice floor of your best guy. Well, you know, what, what are they going to do, but, you know, feel it necessary to fall in line and Hey, you know, if they're pushing him or if they're challenging him, shoot, they're going to do the same thing to me. Yeah. Uh, I am an enormous San Antonio Spurs fan, you know, old man basketball. I, you know, I talked about love and Steve Nash. Well, one, a f- favorite player for me is Nash and one B is Tim Duncan. I mean, and I love it. Uh, you know, one of the times when we were still at Nevada, I was like, I have to go see Tim Duncan play in person. And Sacramento is only a couple hours away. So we ended up getting tickets, went over there. And it was one of those, it was later in Duncan's career. It was the second night of a back to back. And he literally played, I think he played like 12 to 15 minutes. And it was still so worth it for me to go to because we were, we were sat in basically the end zone seats behind the basket yeah. and to watch the Spurs timeouts was, don't get me wrong. I loved watching the game up and down, but to watch those timeouts, it was amazing because you got Tim Duncan, one of the best players of all time, automatic hall of famer. And if he was out of the game, which he was quite a bit of that game, the coaches would meet before they would go, talk to the team. Duncan invariably was the guy basically standing almost where the coach would sit on almost every time out and talk to his guys. And then when pop would sit down, Duncan wasn't just, you know, looking around, you know, seeing what was going on during the timeout. He was literally right over pop's shoulder the whole time out. And that's why I get back to push your, push your best guys to, lead the right way. And, you know, especially we have a hard enough time, I think college wise of your best guys, your older guys to be a vocal leader, like you would hope. Yeah. But if they can be a lead by example guy, and I know he was doing it both ways when I watched him that night, but from a lead by example way, it was astounding to watch. And like I said, if your best guys are leading by example, if they're the guys that are winning sprints, no matter what, you know, during or after practice, if they're the guys that, you know, are showing up on time for everything, you know, they're getting extra shots up. When you're talking as a coach, their eyes are on you. You know, that's the type of guy, you know, I tell our older guys, our leaders all the time, the younger guys are watching you. They're seeing how you, carry yourself they're seeing how you react on a day-to-day basis i said don't take that for granted yeah that man you, you just said a lot of really good stuff in there um i'm you know i'm a spurs fan too so i'm i'm I with like you it. i'm Old with man you. basketball that's right it's they, <laughs> they, i tell people they play basketball the way it was invented to be played yep. they play such good basketball and you know and now look what tim duncan's doing he's sitting right next to pop he's he's yep. the head coach when pop wasn't able to be there this year so right yeah, lots of good stuff there, Coach. Um, uh, final question for you. You know, as a, as a D1 coach, as the head coach of a program, you are, you know, probably asked to talk on podcasts quite a bit or you're asked to come, you know, talk at a clinic. How, how do you continue to be a student of the game when everybody's asking your opinion about everything? What do you do to be like, man, I need to I need to continue being a student as well? What do you do? I reach out to, you know, fellow coaches on a regular basis, but I'm no different than you. I, I don't listen to it. Don't get me wrong. I love listening to some good music, but yeah. and it annoys the heck out of my girls. I listen to podcasts all the time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, for example, I was just listening to a podcast and I haven't finished it yet because I kept pausing it, writing stuff down, or I'd yeah. even go rewind it. 
uh, Coach Shiat, who used to be at Wyoming. And I, I've, got, I've had the opportunity to meet him because we competed against him when we were at Nevada and he was the head coach at Wyoming. Uh, he's just a great resource. And, I'm, and he's just one. I mean, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, I'm listening to him and he's talking about defensive principles. And I happen to be, uh, you know, walking to my house from, you know, in the neighborhood. And I was like, I had to pause it so I could get home. And on my dry erase board, write, you know, scribble down some notes that I'll end up sharing as a staff when, you know, when we meet and talk about, it. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of great clinics that have been done during this, uh, you know, time when the virus has taken over. And yep. I know that, we, you know, I've watched some, you know, our staff, you know, it's not like we've just split it up. But when guys have watched uh, clinics, I know Doug from our staff has been amazing in this regard. He's taken notes on every clinic that he's watched, and he immediately, as soon as he's done, he fires up to the whole staff via email so that we all have it so that either it triggers it, hey, I'm going to watch that one for sure, or if I don't get the chance to, hey, here are some highlights and here's what you know I go over. So it is a constant learning. Uh, you know, I joke about stealing a slogan that we throw up on the wall. I'm the same way in terms of actual basketball, you know, when it comes on the court, you know, one of the best things, you know, I can't wait for the restart of the NBA games because I don't get the chance uh, to watch that much during their regular season, the NBA. Yeah. But I, I will tell you, nobody, you know, I watch as much playoff basketball as anybody I know. And it's as much for the intensity of the games. Just, you know, I love watching basketball, but then invariably I'll be watching a game and I'm hitting pause. I'll hit rewind and, I'm, you know, I'm drawing up something that, I, you know, or a concept that you see that you're like, that's amazing. You know, I, that's, that's yeah. terrific. Look how open of a shot against the best players in the world they were just able to get. So you're constantly taking in new ideas, applying, you know, you know, new concepts and, what makes this job and makes this uh this sport so fun to be a part of absolutely we we had to get a dvr in my house just so i could rewind <laughs> exactly right um coach again like i said earlier I, I started this podcast wanting to learn from other coaches reach out to everybody try and connect with people i never thought i'd get the head coach of the university of idaho so i i really appreciate you being on here well don't think that way i mean like i said I listen to as many podcasts as anybody, and uh, you know it's it's my pleasure to be a part of it. Uh, you know, I've I've learned a great deal, and if if it was a no brainer to join you, just because you know I, I want to always you know feel like I can give back in some way, shape, or form, and if somebody feels like they can pick up something, then I'm I'm happy to be that one to provide it. And uh, you know, we were. We, Anybody in the area, anybody that's up here ever wants to come to practice, please reach out to us. Uh, if you want to contact us with a question, please feel free because, like I said, I've done this for my entire life in terms of reaching out to other coaches. And if you don't yeah. think I appreciate the coaches that have taken the time to get back to me, I mean, I, I certainly want to continue to uh, you know, be a part of the game in that way as best I can. Yeah. And, you know, I emailed you and you shot me an email back the same day. And I, you know, I, I appreciate it. And, you know, good luck to you um, going into your second year, opening the new stadium here soon. Um, looking forward to really good stuff from Idaho basketball coach. Sounds great. Derek, thanks a bunch for having me. I appreciate it. Of course. Thanks, coach. We'll see you later.